All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good to see you here, and welcome uh, to our conversation on defining the U.S. and the changing world, which we concluded is something we should be able to settle in about 45 minutes, so that's about how long we're going to be here. So thanks for coming for that. Now, I, I don't think I need to say uh, much on it uh, for this room because it's obviously an incredibly vital topic. Sometimes I think when you live in the United States and you're thinking about the rest of the world, you forget that one of the central questions in the world is, where does the United States stand? Um, and of course, we've been through uh, a series of tumultuous events in the last 20 years, from 9-11 to the US-China relationship with the, as the century began. The U.S. was working to help China enter the WTO 22 years later. There's a new rivalry. We've been through some tumultuous years in U.S. foreign policy uh, the last few years, uh, whether, it, uh, whether it was uh, w uh, COVID or Afghanistan. Through all this, the U.S. remains the most powerful economic force in the world. The dollar remains the central currency of the global economic system. And as Davos is here to, uh, to uh, demonstrate on, on lots of fronts, we're dealing with all kinds of new and oncoming crises, whether it be COVID or uh, future pandemics or the food crisis that seems to be looming around us, as well as, of course, the Ukraine war. So today we're going to try to talk about where the U.S. stands uh, amid all of these shifts, both in trade and diplomacy, as well as politics, and also, I hope, where it should stand. Uh, very pleased today uh, to have a very distinguished panel here. We've got U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, who is leading the U.S. delegation at uh, Davos this year, year. Seth Moulton, a Democratic Congressman from the 6th District of Massachusetts. Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the CEO of New America, the Washington think tank, and among other roles in your long career, uh, was Director of Policy Planning for Hillary Clinton when she was the Secretary of State. And Tom Donilon who is currently chairman of the BlackRock Investment Institute, but also has served in a number of roles in a long career, including as national security advisor for Barack Obama. So I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, again, I didn't introduce myself, but I'm Matt Murray. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, just before we get started, I'd like to remind uh, our online audience out there that if you're sharing any thoughts on the session through social channels, you should use the hashtag WEF22. Uh, thanks again for being here. Secretary Raimondo, I want to start with you. Uh, we are nearly three months now uh, into uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Can you talk a little bit about how you think uh, you've seen America's security and economic priorities shift in those three months um, and, and, and how they continue to shift right now? Yeah. Um, good evening. It's great to be here. <laughs> Wonderful to be with all of you. Um, and thankful not to be in boots. I think we can agree. That's a benefit of Davos in May, not Booth's. In any event, uh, I would say a few things. First, I think it really drives home how high the stakes are. Uh, and that is not that has never been lost on us, but there's a shared sense of how high the stakes are. And I think you see that in how quickly the world has come together to um, react decisively and boldly as against Russia's aggression. I think it underscores the vitalness of uh, having strong relationships with our allies. So, and President Biden has been very focused on this from day one. He wants to uh, shore up our relationships with our allies. As you know, I've just spent the weekend with the president in Asia shoring up our allies in the Indo-Pacific. Week before that, I was in Paris with the USEU Trade and Technology Council. The fact that the United States was able to build a coalition with three dozen other countries in the matter of a couple of weeks to align our export controls and deny Russia technology is extraordinary. We have never before in history seen the US lead a coalition as it relates to technology and export controls that's that broad and that fast. So I think the point of it is allies matter. If you have that relationship continuously, then when something happens, you can you know, sw swing into action. I mean, you could say this. Does it surprise you, in a sense, given how people were talking about the US and the allies or some of the challenges, the, the, the speed with which that came together when you look at it now? Somewhat, yes. Yes, I was obviously at the tip of the spear of that, trying to get our export controls to line up with other countries. We were prepared, as I said to you earlier, the United States was prepared 
to go it alone if we had to, but we didn't have to because all of Europe, Taiwan, much of Asia came along with us. The final thing I'll say on this topic of kind of what have we learned and what's changed, war is no longer just about tanks and military equipment. Ground zero is technology. Mm. The United States is hobbling Putin's ability to uh, conduct war by denying technology. Semiconductors. You want to talk about, you know, having an ability to have a military operation? It revolves around semiconductors, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, which means it's time for the U.S. to invest in that and lead in that more than we ever have. So when you think now versus even three or four months ago, what are the top U.S security and economic priorities, are they the same as they were, or have they shifted at all because of what's been happening here? I don't think they've shifted, but they've become so much more urgent. Right now, the United States Congress is debating a bill called the CHIPS Act. It's, uh, it's investments in basic research and development, investments in semiconductor production in the United States. They have been considering that bill for over a year. Pass the bill. Pass the bill. Imagine what would happen to the United States if Taiwan denied us semiconductors. We, we purchase 70 plus percent of all of our advanced semiconductors from Taiwan. That is an untenable, vulnerable situation, and Congress needs to pass the CHIPS Act immediately. So it's, we knew that a year ago, but it, it's, if we're going to compete globally, we have to invest now in technology. Con Congressman, I think you and your colleagues are getting heavily <laughs> lobbied here on the <laughs> stage at uh, Davos. Um, I, I well, want the secretary is right. We we need to pass it. I think yeah. we will. Um, but even if we pass that act, it's going to help with domestic chip production. It's not going to help us with the highest end chips. Yeah. Taiwan's still going to control that. So that's an important first step. It doesn't get us all the way. Okay. I want to ask uh, about a specific thing about our goals of you. Now you, you got some pushback from the White House recently because you talked about Ukraine uh, becoming more of a proxy war with Russia. Um, you got a little bit of pushback from them on that. Of course, my, I have two questions really. One, isn't, that, isn't there truth to what you said, given what Secretary in Austin and others have been, have, have been saying about the evolving U.S. aims? But secondly, can you, can you explain what you meant, how you see the conflict, how you see the U.S. aims, and are they the right aims and goals right now? Well, look, of course it's a proxy war in the sense that, you know, Ukraine is doing the fighting. We're providing all the... Uh, the munitions and, and much more, uh, technology and other things. Um, and in so many ways, this is a battle between uh, Russia and the West, the West largely represented and led uh, by us. But, um, but look, I understand the, you know, the White House wants to be careful about provoking Putin, so they had some pushback. The majority of the pushback really came from Tucker Carlson, who, of course, is a Russia apologist, <laughs> so I'm not too concerned about that. But um, look, we, I think that... that we're doing a few things absolutely brilliantly in Ukraine. And I'd start with the alliance work, which is just incredible, uh, the way the administration has pulled everybody together. But when we think about the implications of this going forward and what this means for another potential real fight or proxy fight in Taiwan down the road, we have to have this all done in advance. We can't just respond to a, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. We have to deter and prevent it. That means not only providing Taiwan with all the military supplies that we're now rolling into Ukraine after the conflict started, but it also means preparing the alliances in the Pacific that don't really exist right now. That's why I think President Biden's uh, recent announcement that he's forming at least a loose economic alliance in the Pacific is an incredibly important uh, first step. I think a lot of our policy early on in Ukraine was all about response and not enough about deterrence, and we've got to get that right for um, for China. Do, on the alliance uh, and taking your, your praise of the administration, um, in a certain sense, is Russia an, an easier thing to ally everybody around rather than other potentially harder causes? I mean, we had harder time with Afghanistan as Afghanistan went on. People are hesitant to talk about China too much, even if they do it privately. So how much does Russia point the way to the future and how much does it not point the way to the future? Look, look it's absolutely uh, an easier job to align against Russia. We've had NATO in existence for a very long time, since 1946, mm -hmm. with that explicit purpose in mind. So we were a little bit concerned about how united NATO would be. 
But we had a very strong alliance with a very strong history of work together and cooperation um, throughout a lot of other uh, issues, including uh, post 9-11. That kind of alliance doesn't exist in the Pacific. In fact, some of our key partners, like Japan and South Korea, don't even really get along very well. So there's a lot of work that we have to do. It's also, I think, it was very easy for Europe to see the threat that Russia presented, presented when it invaded Ukraine. We've all learned, I hope by now, that if you don't stop Putin there, he'll go somewhere next. How do you get countries like Switzerland to be aligned with us if it comes to preventing uh, China from invading Taiwan. That's, that's much harder. We're going to come back on the Asia. I want to talk in Marie Slaughter, though, first uh, more about Europe. Picking up on that thought, is this the beginning of a new era of U.S. and European relations, or is this a Russia one-off? No, I think this is a new era in U.S.-European relations, but less because of what the administration's done, although I, I very much also would applaud the, the administration's real kind of shoe leather diplomacy or it's probably <laughs> uh, finger typing diplomacy these days in terms of pulling uh, lots of allies together. But Europe has pulled itself together and Europe is at a moment when the, Britain is no longer part of it, very important there, that creates more space for France and for Germany. Germany I mean, that was, I don't think the Biden administration expected the Schultz announcement, but that was Germany saying, wow, you know, Russia's right there, we have to make a choice, but also saying, and I think people did not pay enough attention to this, a lot of the Germans were saying, we've got to do this ourselves with other Europeans because we can count on the Biden administration right now, but we're not sure we can count on the United States in 2024. So when you say that, though, that, that's a key thing, is that... Uh, um, inconsistency on the part of the United States has been an issue. And to be fair, even before President Trump, it's been something people have talked about for some time. And our panel's on defining the U.S. role in the changing world. So Europe's pulled itself together. But what's the appropriate stance for the United States with Europe in a way that's consistent? What, what role should we play or, or could we conceivably be seen to play? Oh, I would say just more generally, the U.S. should think of itself as an equal partner with Europe, that Europe economically is an equal partner, and militarily, NATO will remain the primary military alliance, but Europe is trying to do much more on defense and to be able to have that particular European blend of military and non-military, military and civilian power. It's very striking that Europe is now talking about, you know, bringing Ukraine into the EU. That's been Europe's great sort of superpower in terms of integrating nations. Europe's talking about the Marshall Plan for Ukraine, not the United States. And as Secretary Raimondo certainly knows, Europe has an order of magnitude more trade with Russia than, than the United States does, right? So they take a bigger hit and they've got, they've got more, more at stake. Going forward, I, if, if I'm advising Europe, I think I say, look, you really do want to realize the full potential of integration and being a superpower. If I'm if advising the United States, I think we want to stand with Europe always, but realistically, and this also goes to the America we're becoming, a yeah. country that will, be, will not have a white majority, which means not a European-American majority. You'll have lots of folks who are looking to, the, to Asia and looking to Latin America. I think we don't think of ourselves as, so much as the major partner, but the equal partner. Mm. Tom Donilon, uh, I want to bring you in, particularly on a couple of economic questions, but you've obviously got a lot of experience, a lot of friends. But one place the U.S. could be a leader with Europe and seems to be poised, if it wants to, is on energy now, particularly with what's happened with Russia. But of course, here we have differing views on the energy uh, situation we've got. Should we open it up? How do we balance that against climate? So is the US doing the right things it needs on energy to be a leader in Europe? Should it be doing more? Should it be doing less? How do we find the balance with that in climate? Well, I mean, it, you know, one of the, the Ukraine crisis has been as a global crisis with a lot of knock-on effects, right? And it has effects on commodities, on inflation, has effects on emerging markets. And it has had a serious effect on the geopolitics of energy. Essentially, I think we're on the, we have the prospect here of rewiring the geopolitics of energy globally as a result of the crisis in, uh, the crisis in Ukraine. And I think a couple of things about it. Number one, uh, the United States um, resources right, in this area, right, which are substantial 
and do give the United States strategic advantage has been important for us to be able to support Europeans uh, as they decouple themselves from uh, Russia, mm. uh, which is, by the way, I think going to be one of the acid tests of the European Union and the Europeans going forward, is whether or not they can correct the mistake that the Europeans have made over the last decade plus, including, by the way, since even 2014, of becoming overly dependent on Russian fossil fuels, uh, which has been a lot of leverage, obviously, in this, mm. in this war, and it's provided a lot of the um, uh, revenue, if you will, for <laughs> Putin's ability to, to carry on the war. So I think the United States energy position is an important strategic asset, first point. The second is that uh, there are short-term and long-term challenges in that, I think. You know, in the short term, we do have challenges as the European Union decouples itself from Russia of providing, back, you know, backfilling uh, the, the uh, energy that uh, Europe needs uh, in the short to medium term, in oil and in gas. And the United States can help, especially in the gas, on the gas front. Uh, it can help, I think, uh, kind of backfill with respect to Europe's needs. And that's important to do uh, going forward. The energy transition is that. It's going to be a transition. And the third piece of this, I think, is uh, that this is an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to get quite serious about investment in a cleaner energy future. Mm -hmm. So there are shorter-term, medium-term challenges that we have. Uh, and there are longer-term challenges and opportunities, I think, which this crisis uh, presents for, uh, for the United States and Europe uh, to, work to, uh, to work together on. Uh, are we taking advantage of those opportunities, Secretary, do you think? I think we're starting to. Yes, I do. I think we're starting to. I mean, I agree with Tom around clean energy. You're seeing uh, a greater sense of urgency and momentum around making these investments. Why? I mean, this is true in our politics, I suppose, to some extent. But why is it that clean energy and gas are oppositional instead of two holsters in the same set of weapons. Uh, why, is that, why does that seem to be the way that we frame the debate? Because what you're saying, I think, Tom, is we should be rushing, including bringing energy in right now from the US for the short term to right. fill the void while thinking in the long term. Yeah, there's going to be a rewiring, as I said. You know, I mean, essentially, that, uh, that, the, that the supply for Europe in the, in the medium term, right, and maybe a little longer than that, right, is going to be from Australia and the United States and Qatar and others, because it won't have that energy from um, gas from, uh, from Russia. My own view uh, is that it's matter, it, it is a transition, Matt, right? Mm -hmm. And there is a transition um, path where you move from you know, dirty fuels to less dirty fuels to clean energy. Uh, and natural gas provides, at this point, an important bridge fuel. Uh, now, there's some controversy around that, right? Because it will involve investing in infrastructure, particularly in Europe right now, in order to meet the needs. But there are practical needs here. We've had a war, a crisis, we're going to have actually Europe move to a more productive stance, both in terms of its lack of dependence and the lack of leverage that Russia can have on them in energy, and also ultimately to a cleaner energy future. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm not in that camp that sees it as an absolute, you know, kind of either or. I think this is a process that we need to go through, particularly in light of the crisis, uh, to get there. I mean, if you listen to Congress, we see it as either or. And I'm not proud of that. I don't understand why you can't hold two ideas in your head at the same time. Uh, the first of which is that we should not be addicted to oil, and in the long term, we've got to get off of it, and we can transition to a clean energy future, and that's very good for our national security. It will make us a stronger country. But in the short term, we should be buying oil and gas from Americans, not from autocrats. But Democrats are only allowed to believe the first, and Republicans seem to only be allowed to believe the second, and we really have to do both. Mm -hmm. Tom, I want to ask you one more yeah. thing, and then I'm going to come back to the secretary, okay. but it's... It, 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 it's, it's, uh, affects, uh, it's, it's tangential to your current job a little bit. One of the things that we saw here was, a, I think everybody thinks, a remarkable response by American and, to a large degree, Western companies isolating Russia yeah. very quickly. The secretary referred to that earlier. I think the speed and the scale surprised everybody. In some cases, might have almost awed them, in some, some cases of uh, potential American adversaries. Uh, I think Larry Fink said in his annual letter that this marks a new era, a new era of combat, and really that we're we're seeing a swift change. What does it? What does the current state of U.S. economic might and the mobilization of that and yeah. soft American power tell you about the U.S. influence in in future conflicts? Yeah, well, it's been very important, as the secretary said, with respect to this conflict. The United States have been organized, being able to organize a multi-dimensional effort. And, that's key. and I don't think this happens without U.S. leadership, frankly. Even on the military side, you know, um, Emory, you know, the 80% the, um, of NATO's kind of military might still comes from non-EU members, right? It needs to change. I said that, that, that I think that one of the acid tests for the EU will be getting off Russian um, 
Russian oil and gas. Another key test going forward here, kind of correcting what's been kind of a cardinal fault, I think, is also getting right on level of military spending uh, going, uh, going, yeah. going forward. But I think it's not just the companies getting out, Matt. It, but I think it's a more general thing. I mean, the, uh, the effort by the United States involved uh, diplomatic efforts, right, to isolate Russia with very large votes, for example, at the United Nations in opposition to the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. It involves military supply, right? This has been an important part of this. You know, if you think about uh, why, did the, why has Russia failed thus far to achieve its plan A, right, which was to take Kiev quickly, right, uh, decapitate the, the government, put a new government in place that was more low, that was, was uh, beholden to Moscow and have that be their operation. That failed. The first plan failed. Why is that? It failed because there was poor planning on the, on the, on the Putin side, who's, who's become an increasingly isolated, I think, and, and poor decision maker as, as a result. It obviously involved um, a better than expected um, mm -hmm. kind of, I mean, incredible uh, um, uh, efforts by the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian military, right? It also involved failure of the Russian military in ways that we can talk about. But it also required the United States and NATO and the world to provide the arms that were required to push back the Russians. Mm -hmm. And that had to be organized. Now, I still have in my, in my mind thinking about this, you know, the picture of Secretary Austin at Ramstein Air Force Base, right? You know, kind of or organizing this kind of broad appeal conference, if you will, right? For providing uh, necessary arms to, uh, arms, to, arms to Ukraine. And the last piece is on the economy. And I think you're right. Part of this effort has been uh, to deny Russia the benefits of, of the global economy. That's essentially, I think, Madam Secretary, kind of the, 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 the idea, which is to basically deny this actor, right, who has behaved in the most atrocious ways the benefits of being a member of, kind of the globalized and financial system in the world. And we organize that, right? And that shows you the power of the global financial system uh, if it's organized, but it's not unilateral. This is more, one of the most, let's say, one thing it's, you can never, these sanctions uh, can't be implemented effectively unilaterally, right? It has to be kind of the, the, the entire West that's had to kind of get behind this. And for companies, uh, I think you're exactly right. We say one of the surprises, at least for me, and I think for lots of people, is that six or 700 companies who were not mandated to get out, got out of Russia or suspended operations. I think that's because of the kind of the ESG right now. The S has become a really important piece mm -hmm. of this in terms of reputation. And the last thing I'll say, as you referenced it, is that this will get a lot of attention, I think, in the East. Uh, where other countries, you know, who may have who may have disagreements, who may have uh, with the West, will think hard about what the, the what the what the West is able to muster. Madam Secretary, I want to talk about that. As you mentioned, you came back there a couple questions, but the first one is is, and it's an important one, I think, here at at, uh, at WEF this year. Um, is globalization over as we've known it, and is it different now, or are there different globalizations? I mean, on the one hand, you've got, as, as, as all of you have said, this potent alliance. On the other hand, some actors are going to be outside it, and there is kind of some decoupling and, and competition going on, as we'll talk about. But the theory of globalization certainly doesn't seem to have brought Russia into uh, the Society of Nations as a hope. So what is globalization now? I want to start there and then we can talk about Asia. Later. Yeah, look, globalization is not, is not dead at all. Mm. I mean, um, I think actually, by the, I agree with everything Tom said, and I think that uh, fortifying our relationships with our allies is more important than ever. Now it will look different, right? So. The reason that I was just in Asia is because the, the president launched this Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And it's not a traditional trade agreement. You sh from World War II until now, when you say globalization, what do you think? You think trade. You think trade agreements. And there have been many challenges uh, with trade agreements for workers of, of the United States and many countries. So uh, yes, of course, we still want trade, and yes, we want um, to work across borders, but it's also time for new kinds of innovative frameworks so that our economies can work better together. For example, around supply chains. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> trade agreements and globalization did not work very well during COVID when supply chains went down. We need, in order to have resilient supply chains, we have to have new forms of uh, economic relationships with our partners and allies. By the way, part of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is a supply chain pillar. So, no, I think we have to be innovative in the way that we 
form economic relationships with our allies and work with allies who share our values. So the, sub, the subtext of the uh, visit to Asia, and sometimes it was not the subtext as yesterday uh, uh, on the subject of Taiwan, is China. And I think everybody agrees, one, the U.S.-China relationship is the most strained that it's, uh, it's, it's been certainly in, the, in, the, in, in this century and has stayed that way. And second, um, it's pretty bipartisan feeling now in Washington to be concerned about China. It is the most important relationship in the world, the U.S. and China. So the administration is there making alliances, thinking about how to help allies in Asia, but that relationship, of course, remains central. So where do you think the U.S.-China relationship is and should go, and what does stability in that relationship look like? Yeah. So it is, as you say, strained. But again, when in the same way when people say globalization, you think of trade, when you say the relationship with, with China, you think of defense. And I suggest we have to think a lot more about offense in our relationship with China. China spends more as a percent of their GDP on industrial policy than they do on their military. Think about that for a minute. They are spending more money, billions of dollars a year, investing in, strategically, in industries, in technology, in semiconductors, in artificial intelligence, than they do on their military. The United States needs to pick up its pace investing in our workers, in our infrastructure, in emerging technologies, in talent, in semiconductors. So the relationship with China um, I mean, that's, we need to do that for America. But frankly, if we're going to compete in the global, you know, in the world, if we're going to have leverage with China and compete with China, if we're going to have our allies in the Indo-Pacific want to have a close relationship with us, we have to strengthen America, and that means investing in these critical areas. Congressman, do you think that... Uh, well, how seriously uh, do you take the, the, the concern that the U.S. is in danger of losing what we think of as our technological or corporate edge that way because of the kinds of things the Secretary is talking about. I think it's a serious danger for exactly the reasons the Secretary said. And I, I couldn't agree more, Madam Secretary, that we need to invest a lot more in winning. And it's not just about building up our military presence. It's about winning the AI race. It's about winning the biotech race. I represent uh, a district just north of Boston, which is the biotech capital of the world, our number one competitor is Beijing. And, and guess what? It's Chinese Communist Party federal policy to make Beijing win. Mm. We have an amazing private sector, but we don't have the federal government saying um, that we're going to win this biotech race, and we, and, and we probably should. To, to, your, to your core question, though, about globalization, I, I mean, I think globalization is alive and well, but it's becoming increasingly bifurcated in you know, between the democracies that we represent in the West and the autocracies that China and Russia represent. China and Russia have little in common culturally or economically, but they absolutely have two common enemies, the United States and, and democracy itself. And so just in the last few months, we're seeing this increasing move towards decoupling our economy from, from theirs, making sure we have our own resilient supply chains. Um, and, and we're also seeing, uh, we've been seeing with China's Belt and Road Initiative over the past decade, that them trying to build those key alliances, build all the China-Africa partnerships and whatnot. They're trying to you know, construct their own uh, set of global alliances that are separate from our own. Mm. So that presents a whole um, you know, new set of, uh, set of challenges for globalization. And it's incredibly important that we win this race because it's not just about us versus China. It's about ultimately whether democracy prevails over autocracy. Anne-Marie, you have something to say, but I want to ask you one thing about it. Does the United States show up consistently as a permanent presence around the world on these kinds of things? Are we there regularly, consistently with our allies? Obviously, we weren't there from 2016 to 2020. And again, I, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a Democrat. We're all Democrats on this panel. Realistically, you you have to you have to tell anybody you're advising to be to, to give us about a 50-50 shot. At least that the, that's not what I want. That's what I worry about in terms of 2024. 
uh, in term, and, and it, it's not just about Trump. It's about a whole wing of the Republican Party that has decided that the things we held, that I always thought we held most dear in terms of being in the world um, are, are not as important. Mm. But I, I, I have to challenge what is a consensus here, and I'm thinking, I was sitting here thinking, <laughs> this is the difference between being an American and being a Russian <laughs> or a Chinese, right? I get to disagree, uh, even with folks in my own party and folks I really admire. But I want to challenge, I mean, we're defining the US in a changing world. It's also a changing US. I'll start by saying I do not think the most important relationship in the world is the US and China. I think it is US and Europe for values, for finance, for trade, uh, for military. Where would we be right now if we were not aligned with Europe? And when the United States and Europe together are aligned, we're over 50% of, of world GDP, and we can do anything, particularly in terms of all of our allies, point one. Point two, you know, we have done, I was really interested to hear Secretary Raimondo talk about uh, export controls. We've done a lot with our other allies. But if anybody listened to Ian Bremmer's panel yesterday when he was talking to Alex Stubb, the former foreign minister of Finland, uh, and I forget who else was on the panel, but there was a, a prominent head of an Indian think tank who just said, you know, we're not buying this democracies versus autocracies. No way. And look at who, look at who abstained in the, in the human rights vote. Mexico, Brazil, South Africa, Egypt, India, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and to the point of Asia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia. Those are countries that abstain from pushing Russia out of the Human, of the human Rights Council mm. at a time when Russia is committing gross war crimes. I'd say the rest of the world, lots of democracies who we want to stand with us don't have as clear a view of what's at stake here as the United States does and I think uh, Europe does. I, I do agree very strongly that we need to be investing at home, that we do absolutely need uh, to, to be shoring up everything uh, domestically to play the role we want to play. Um, but I would say, thinking about the role in Europe going forward, the role in, in the United States going forward, again, we should think about a very large, very powerful group of countries that are the regulatory power in the world, much more than the United States. And the last thing I'll say is, if you think, as I think, the, the national security threat in this century is not China, it is climate. Europe has a plan, Europe has a path, and we are still fighting about it. Okay, I... I, I I'm overstating a little no, just for the sake of the panel, but... That's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to follow up on one thing. By the way, for the record, I'm the moderator. I'm not on the panel, so I'm a political independent. I think that's important. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, which is true. But so there's a lot of what you said, uh, both about the global implications of climate, but also what's working and what's not. Um, you, you've been thinking a lot about renewal. Obviously, one thing we're seeing is NATO is getting a big shot in the arm right now. But there's also an ongoing active debate about a lot of other institutions. Uh, we saw what happened with uh, the WTO and China, for instance. How seriously do you think we need to rethink some of the institutions that were set up after the war for the world that we're in today? And where would you focus attention if you do think we need to rethink that? What's not working and what needs to be fixed? <laughs> where do we start? I mean, look, in, in 2045, the world can't be run by the victors of World War II. And that's really how the rest of the world sees it, right? The UN Security Council are the victors of World War II. Uh, and that would be like, you know, our being run in 1945 by the victors in 1845. The UN knows that, and the UN's been pretty irrelevant in, the, in this particular uh, conflict, at least if you imagine how the, how the original authors of the UN thought about it. The other problem is, it's, <laughs> I'm thinking about Lael Brainerd's spaghetti bowl, it's just a mess if you map global institutions on any big issue, take health, You've got the, the traditional ones, the UN ones, the regional ones. Then you have all the public-private ones that come together. You have all these smaller initiatives. You have then the ways of end running the UN, all the G groups. So effectively, you, you've got to align, you've got to, to, to abolish, you've got to rationalize. You can't, I don't think you're going to reform the UN in some grand global concert. I just don't think that's going to happen. I do think there are ways, and actually, investment has a lot to do with this. Taking the institutions that work, particularly the ones that bring all three sectors together, 
measuring how well they work on very defined goals, and then putting the money there. Yeah. Tom, as somebody who was in government, defending these, and now you're in the private sector and you're, you're free to say <laughs> what it was like. <laughs> What, what, what would you, what's your response and what would you fix in, out there? Well, a couple of things. I mean, well, the most important thing that I would focus on for the United States is, um, is rebuilding its domestic strength. Uh, and, and, any, any and what does that mean? It means a lot of things. I mean, any national security advisor would say that, I think, today. It means investing in, I don't get to why in a second, it means invest, investing in core capabilities that we have. You look back and think what it's meant the United States prosperity and security to have been the tech leader in this world since World War II. Uh, you know, and think about that and think about how to preserve that and extend that leadership is absolutely critical. We also have to think very hard about the health of our, of our people and the health of our society, I think is absolutely critical. You know, and if you do a, if you do a balance sheet uh, on assets and liabilities of the United States, right? If, if you go, we have tremendous assets, right? We can go through them. But the, on the liability side, it is mainly about, I think, investing it's about the health of our people and our society. It's about the health of our system and the ability of our system to recognize, take on challenges, and do something about it. I think those are the critical. I want to, I want to talk about, just for 10 seconds, about Anne-Marie's point you on China being. versus. I was nodding I know, but I'm going to talk about China and Europe <laughs> for a second here. But, but I think those are the, I, mean, I think as a, as, a, you know, as, a, as a national security professional, those would be the things I think that you would focus on first, on domestic. On the China and Europe piece, the world is, the, the world's not monolithic. Anne-Marie, I agree with that. And you can see that in uh, the discussion about the Western um, response and, and pressure on, on Russia. Uh, and the world is going to fracture as a result, I think, of this entire. Ultimately, the structure of the world will be a more fractured, uh, will be a more fractured place, I think. And it, it is absolutely important for the United States to pay a lot of attention to the middle powers uh, and should be an important thrust of what the United States does. But Europe is our most important partner, bar none. But I do think China is our most important challenge at the end, at the end of the day on the security front. Now, we can, sure. we can have a conversation about climate, right? About that, which I, as you know, I, I agree with you on. But I think as a, as, a, as a force to be reckoned with in the world, and the main game there is we have military issues, as Seth was saying, in, uh, in the Asia. But the main game there is technology mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So Congressman, I want to pick up on one thing if I can, because and I, and I, I wanted to do it. But when we talk about institutions, um, one of the things that people talk about a lot in democracy is where you sit, the Congress, mm -hmm. and the political polarization and challenges we have here. And that's obviously a source of huge debate. It plays around the world in different ways. In some ways, the United States is designed to, to be a, a system of conflict to then work through. But first, what do you think the polarization of the United States, how does that play for us around the world? And, and how does it affect our reputation? And second, realistically, what, if anything, could we do about it now? So candidly, the, the polarization is a big problem. And during the Trump administration, uh, there were, we spent a lot of time going around the globe with bipartisan codels to show uh, our, our allies and our adversaries that despite what you might hear about going on in the White House and see on TV, here you have Democratic and Republican representatives from, from the House and the Senate saying that we're aligned on key issues. And going to Asia was a very important uh, stop on you know, those, those types of trips to really show that Congress will outlast uh, this, this administration and we're aligned on key, on key issues, like supporting NATO, for example. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in the long term, there's no question that this divide is a, is a big problem. And I think that, that, candidly, it's a huge weakness of the United States. There are reforms that you can make to Congress, structural reforms to improve it. I think a different primary process, probably ranked choice voting, uh, getting money out of politics. Uh, I, I argue that we should increase uh, terms in Congress from two to four years so you're not spending your entire time uh, uh, fundraising. And I think you might even want to consider term limits because it's amazing how much political courage people tend to develop when they're in their last term. <laughs> so there are a lot of things, but the problem with all those changes that I just mentioned is most of them, I'm no constitutional scholar, but most of them probably require constitutional changes. But at the same time, despite all the divides, there is some important bipartisan work that, that's being done. And I co-chaired a future defense task force on the House Armed Services Committee, where some of our most important conclusions on this very defense-focused panel were about the things that you hear talked about uh, uh, more broadly in terms of our economy investing in AI, investing in biotech, and winning that race. Developing a whole new generation of alliances, because NATO is great for defending Europe, it doesn't do as much with China. 
NATO is great for preventing a Russian invasion uh, in a traditional sense, yet Russia invades us all the time through the internet, and NATO was not designed in 1946 uh, to stop that. It's also about uh, developing, winning this game in terms of modernization of our weapon systems. Mm -hmm. You know, the first symbolic thing that we did to reinforce NATO was send a bunch of tanks to Poland, but we're all watching on TV as tanks get eviscerated by drones. So it's wonderful that, that NATO is stepping up and all these EU members are investing more in defense. They've got to invest in the future of defense in things like drones and not, and not things like tanks if they're going to be an effective deterrent. And then finally, another key, the key point um, was developing a new generation of treaties. Because I'll give you just of a trees. narrow example. Yes, and I'll give you a narrow example to illustrate what I'm talking about. The future of warfare is highly dependent on artificial intelligence. We're going to have a lot more autonomous fighting vehicles in the air, uh, on the ground, and certainly under the sea than we do now. How we set the rules, the rules of the road for the use of AI, is incredibly important, not just for the future of humanity, but for our strategic advantage. Because if China sets the rules of the road for AI, and we don't have some sort of Geneva Convention like we did in response to the use of chemical weapons in World War I to deal with this new era of warfare, we're going to be at a big disadvantage because China doesn't care about collateral damage. China doesn't care about killing civilians, but we do. And so if we adhere to our values, our, essentially our robots will be more constrained and we'll be more likely to lose that fight. So we have got to get ahead of this issue, and we're not doing enough of that Wait, today. You said trees. Treaties. Treaties. Oh, treaties. treaties. I love trees. <laughs> I absolutely love, love that. trees. Yeah, so. I'm a huge fan of trees, but I think we need to do more for treaties. Too. Madam Secretary, I want to bring it back to you then and sort of bring it back to where we started. So we've talked a lot here about a lot of the shifts that are happening. Russia, Ukraine, the expansion of NATO. I want to ask one specific question on Russia, but then I want to finish on a broader one, which is um, the, the thinking about the U.S. role in the world. Can the U.S. and Russia find some way back, or is, is Russia, is it just different? And we can't go back there. It, we cannot even begin to have that discussion now. I mean, Putin needs to end this war, and it's premature to even think about that. What I will say is, and I know President Biden is very committed to this, Russia needs to pay a serious long-term price for the, the way they're behaving. Including reparations for Ukraine? Absolutely. Definitely, at least. Everybody thinks so? Yes. Yeah, but, but even more than that. I mean, to Tom's point earlier, they need to be denied the benefits of the you know, global economy and the global economic order for a long time. These export controls, they're not going away anytime soon. So, you know, your question is hard for me to even get my head around, given where we are now. Nope. Step one is we need to end this war. But I think that does say something about U.S. power and that we still have power to leverage. Uh, There's no doubt like we, have, we have power. There's been so much to respond to. Yeah. But, you know, Tom made the comment that the Export Control Coalition wouldn't have been built without U.S. leadership. Absolutely true. I think so much of what we're doing, yes, Europe is a partner. They are there. They were strong. They were swift. This was because of U.S. leadership. Yeah. Um, to the point of Indo-Pacific versus Europe or China, I will simply say this. I don't want to take anything away from the U.S.-EU relationship, but, you know, we rolled out this announcement yesterday. It was the U.S. plus a dozen economies in the Indo-Pacific. It represents 40 percent of the world's GDP, and it's the fastest growing. So where are we today? I agree with you about Europe. Where are we going to be in 10 years? We better pay close attention to the Indo-Pacific countries and you, you say, and I agree with you, Singapore and these other countries should have been with us on human rights. They're in a tough zip code with China as their neighbor. And if the United States doesn't show up more and have a proactive economic strategy in that region, they'll continue to vote with China, which is why we do need to really show up consistently. And economics is the coin of the realm, along with technology. I think that's the last word, Madam Secretary, but it's oh. been a great... It, it's been a great panel, a great discussion. Tom Donlan, Anne-Marie Slaughter, Seth Moulton, and Secretary Raimondo, thank you very much for being here today, and thanks for the conversation. <laughs>